Thank you. So I will briefly introduce the RCD for folks who aren't familiar with it. Um, for those who don't know the RCD, we're, we're what we often describe as the best form of government that you've probably never heard of. Um, RCDs are special districts, local government. We've been uh, boots on the ground in Western San Mateo County since 1939, existing in partnership with the USDA. Um, there's about 100 conservation districts around California and thousands more nationwide. They're in almost every county of the nation. And um, the next slide will tell you a little bit more about how we work. So um, we were formed as a special district. That's a form of local government. That means that uh, constituents within San Mateo County formed us to respond to a, a need um, that they had. And in the 30s, it was to protect soils. Um, we have evolved since then, and we do a great deal more than uh, protecting soils as a response to the Dust Bowl crisis. But we do overall, no matter what we do, our role is to help people help the land. And we work across jurisdictions, across boundaries, across land ownerships, across land managers um, on, a, on a variety of issues. We are non-regulatory and we work where we're invited. We're not an advocacy group or a regulator. We often provide confidential technical assistance. And we have very diverse tools in our toolkit to accomplish conservation and resource protection. Sometimes we provide technical assistance, sometimes we implement projects, sometimes we do education and outreach. We can pretty much do what is needed um, to help people help the land. The one thing that is true is that literally everything that we do is in partnership with others. So throughout this presentation, when we talk about we, typically that involves the RCD and others. Um, so just want to be clear about that. Um, okay, now I think we can go to the next slide. And these are the RCD's current programs. So um, tonight, obviously, we're going to be focusing, focusing on water and furthermore on water quality. Um, in, um, in other cases, we focus on water resources, water development, water conservation. We do a lot of work around climate mitigation and adaptation restoring habitat for threatened and endangered species in our wildlife programs. We assist farmers and ranchers and other agricultural producers with being stewards of natural resources. And most recently, we have been uh, developing a new program area to protect forest health and develop resilience to fire in San Mateo County. But tonight, as I mentioned, we're gonna be focusing on water quality. So about the water quality program, our water quality program essentially has three prongs. It's to understand water quality, understand the sources of, uh, of pollution. Um, and when I say water quality, we are typically almost exclusively focused on uh, what the quality of water in creeks or at beaches or in the ocean, environmental water, not typically drinking water, which is typically um, something that is uh, tested or cared for or provided or regulated through your utility, though not entirely. Um, the other thing besides understanding uh, our water quality is to reduce pollution and, um, and eliminate sources pollution and clean up pollution wherever possible. And then the third prong is to engage people around, uh, around water quality, helping through outreach, education, community science programs, helping youth and adults uh, be watershed stewards and understand their impacts on the land and how they can protect water quality. So those are the general overall of our water quality program. And then in this webinar, and now you can go to the next slide, thank you. Our goals for this webinar today is the what, where, who, and how of this is to the what. So we're gonna talk about what pollutants we've been looking at, what their effects are, where we find water pollution and where we where we do know it to be coming from, where it's coming from, who is helping to identify, monitor, and protect water quality, and, and how we can help. Um, everybody on this webinar um, has a role to play in how we can help clean water stay clean and polluted water get cleaner. So um, with that said, I also am going to pass it over to Noah, but let me introduce Noah briefly first. So um, um, Noah manages the 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 day to day water quality program, and um, that includes monitoring, mapping, 
data analysis, education, and outreach efforts, as well as our efforts to actually remediate pollutants. Uh, before joining the RCD, NOAA worked on water quality issues and green infrastructure in New York, California, and the United Kingdom. Most recently before the RCD, NOAA worked as an environmental analyst for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. He has a master's degree in aquatic resource management from King's College London, and his undergraduate and graduate work both focus on water quality. And then last but not least, before we get into the, this webinar, I want to note that the, the lands that we're talking about and the water resources that we're talking about, um, the impairments that to them are relatively recent. And just want to note that for thousands and thousands of years before these impairments, these lands were managed sustainably by the indigenous uh, Ohlone people who uh, populated this landscape. So the, the land uses and the impairments that we're talking about today are in uh, really the more recent years in the last 100 years or so. So that said, Noah, I will pass it off to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kellex, and uh, thank you to everyone for attending today. We have uh, 68 attendees, so it's really great to see you all here. Um, so before I get into kind of our current understanding of water quality on the mid coast, um, I wanna talk a little bit about where, where that understanding comes from. Um, we've been working, uh, the RC's been working for decades now, uh, looking at water quality in the mid coast uh, with many, many partners. Um, and, you know, we look at water quality. Uh, we have some uh, citizen science projects, uh, the first flush program where we have uh, members of the community go out and collect water samples. Uh, we have several uh, long term monitoring programs where we go and collect regular regularly uh, water samples in San Vicente Creek and San Pedro Creek. Uh, we also have some older projects. Um, it takes a community. Um, which Kelch will talk about in a little bit. Um, and we also um, use data from other organizations and a big thank you to the county for their routine water quality sampling data uh, and uh, Surfrider for collecting data as well. Um, this is just up here to show um, just a big thank you to our partners and just to show the kind of geographical range of where we've collected water samples. So each pin on this map on the right um, is a place where we've actually physically gone out and collected a water sample and have it analyzed so we can try to understand water quality in the mid coast a little bit better. Um, and um, so it does not include every everywhere we've ever sampled, just all the ones that can really find uh, coordinates for drop, drop pins accurately. Um, and you'll notice on this long list of uh, watersheds, some familiar names such as Capistrano, um, <clears throat> San Vicente Creek, uh, and a few places in Pillow Point Harbor. So before I get uh, into our understanding, I always want to do kind of a just a quick overview of uh, the idea of a watershed. And for, so, for those of you that aren't super familiar, a watershed is essentially an area of land that shares the same drainage. Um, and the take home message here is really that every action that we do, everything we do on land has water quality impacts downstream. So this is to draw your attention to the, uh, to the actions that we as individuals do every day on land that can impact water quality. So we see someone washing their car, uh, that could be washing down detergents, brake dust, uh, or um, oils and grease onto the ground. We see someone walking their dog, perhaps they pick up after them, perhaps they don't. Uh, overflowing trash can, uh, litter on the ground. Uh, essentially everything on this uh, drawing applies to us here on the coast side. Um, and each of these actions can contribute to water quality. And during the dry season, a lot of these contaminants that are ending up on the ground really just, for the most part, just kind of sit there. Uh, and it's not until the first big rain of the year when we see a lot of those contaminants being washed off, uh, off of land into creeks, into stormwater systems, and out into our beaches. Um, and this is exactly what the first flush program, which I'm gonna explain, talk about in a little bit, is all about. And just a little bit about um, the contaminants that we're gonna talk about today, you know, we're not, we didn't go out and sample every single contaminant, every single pollutant out there. Um, we just want to focus on a few of these important ones, um, things that have that can negatively impact the marine life, the critters that we share our um, important coastal habitats with, things like heavy metals, um, which can uh, negatively impact both wildlife and also humans as well. Uh, we looked at things like nutrients, and these are um, naturally occurring uh, chemicals that are really important for plant growth, but in excess levels can cause things like algal blooms, 
um, and those can be pretty harmful. And then another thing I'm gonna focus on is bacteria. Um, this is, you know, this is a big, big topic. It's received a lot of attention, a lot of concern here on the coast side. Um, and for good reason, there are a number of water bodies that are impaired with this bacteria. And I'm gonna walk you through a few of these water bodies and our current understanding in a bit. So the FIRST FLUSH program is our big annual citizen science program. And it's been carried out in San Mateo County since 2003. And it's also held in Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. And each of these three counties has watersheds that discharge to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. This is a, this is a big important uh, marine habitat. So this data, uh, long-term data set can show us a little bit about some of the contaminants washing off the land and into this, into this reserve. Um, and in 2020, we had uh, 20 volunteers go out and collect samples from 12 sites between Montera and Kelly Avenue and Half Moon Bay. And just a quick summary of the findings, um, bacteria was above recommended levels at all sites, uh, which is um, not ideal, but not also not entirely surprising given that um, because of months of built up contaminants on land, all being washed off at once, this is really the worst case scenario for water quality. It's kind of I like to think about it, the worst day of the year for water quality. Um, so we, not entirely surprising there. Uh, we looked at orthophosphates, which is one of those nutrients I was telling you about. Um, that was above recommended ranges in all but one site, which is actually uh, pretty normal for first flush data. Uh, we looked at uh, some heavy metals, including copper, um, which were within recommended ranges in most sites. Um, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. And we also look at nitrates and some other metals, as well as total suspended solids, which were mostly in recommended ranges. So in the first flush program, are the samples that our volunteers collect are analyzed in the lab for heavy metals. Um, and these are things like copper, lead, and zinc, and they can come from gutters or roofs, brake pads, tires, industrial waste, paint, even fires. Um, and these can have negative impacts on, on wildlife. Um, and you know, historically, since 2003, we really haven't found heavy metals in excess levels at any of our sites in San Mateo County. Um, but this year, uh, we did have two sites in Princeton uh, where there was, uh, we did have some metals above recommended ranges. Uh, that's by no means a long-term trend, um, but it's something to keep an eye out um, in the future. And just real quick for context, um, this is just comparison of total of lead data from the first flush program in San Mateo County and in Monterey counties. And if you look at um, the numbers at the top left-hand corner of each of these graphs on the top of the y-axis, uh, you can see in the San Mateo graph, uh, 30 is at the top, and that's the upper limit of where we wanna see lead um, in our coastal environments. And we can see we've actually never had any samples where lead was above that number in San Mateo County uh, until, until this year. And then in Monterey, you see that number on the top left goes up to 90. So just a little context that um, this, this contaminant may be a little bit more prevalent in some other areas than in San Mateo County. We also look at uh, nutrients in the first flush programs. Those are nitrates and orthophosphates. And these are again, naturally occurring, uh, really important for plant growth, but when you find them in excess levels, they can cause um, some issues, um, noticeably, uh, note algal blooms, which is this image in the background here, um, which can cause both uh, problems for both human health and, and ecological health. Um, and in the first flush program, we commonly find orthophosphates uh, above recommended ranges, but very rarely do we find nitrates um, in recommended ranges. Sorry, nitrates above recommended ranges, my mistake. Um, and this is uh, just a little side-by-side -side of uh, nitrates and orthophosphates in San Mateo County. And what I've done is I've ranked these sites, uh, calculated the averages and ranked them. So the kind of lowest average on the left and the highest average on the right. And this is really here to draw your attention to the kind of types of, uh, types of catchments that we see elevated nutrient levels. Um, really interestingly, because nutrients can come from agriculture, things like fertilizers and pesticides, um, you know, we might expect to see these all the way to the right on these graphs to be more of those agricultural catchments. But if you look at nitrates, we see West Point Avenue ditch, Vassar Avenue, these are, these are hardly agricultural. Uh, and all the way to the right on the orthophosphate graph, we see Capistrano outfall. Um, because those, are, those contaminants are somewhat associated with agricultural pollution, or so we might have thought, 
Um, I would have maybe assumed that Frenchman's Creek would be all the way to the right on this list, but it's not. And it's just a important uh, lesson learned to let science lead you and um, not, you know, not lead by your theories. Um, and sometimes things can be quite surprising. And Kelix, did you have a similarly surprising uh, finding before I joined the RCD? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for, for pinging me in on that. Um, yeah, so the the program that Noah mentioned a little while ago that we called It Takes a Community to Care for a Watershed, I know it's a kind of long name, so we called it It Takes a Community, um, was a citizen science program a number of years ago where people went out, um, volunteers went out once a month every month for a year to collect baseline data on creeks from um, from uh, Martini Creek for the bottom of Devil's Slide down to, I think it was to Denison or San Vicente Creek, uh, just north of Pillar, Pillar Point Harbor. Um, and we took a sample at the top and like above human uses and that down at the mouth. And um, we found, um, I remember uh, coming from a farm, we, uh, we found a result that showed um, that the nitrates coming off the farm, which we, you would expect maybe from fertilizers, were, um, were below detectable limits for our equipment, but the field blank, in other words, the, the bottled water that we used to compare it to and check and make sure our test, you know, that our sampling was working, um, was showing four times the recommended environmental limit for nitrates. So, you know, I was certain that um, that the volunteer had made a mistake and asked staff to go out and redo it. And they actually found the same results when they redid it. And so much to my surprise, the water coming off of a farm had nitrates so low that we couldn't detect them with our equipment, but the bottled water, a brand that I would not now drink, um, was four times the environmental limits. And it was just a real eye opener for me. Um, to use science instead of assumptions, I definitely would have thought it would have been the farm. Thanks, Kellex. Um, and this is just another slide just to show kind of how we fare in terms of nitrates um, as compared to another county in the program. Um, and you can see uh, actually the kind of higher limit where we want to see nitrates is about 2.5. So you can see there's a couple, but very rarely do we find nitrates above those recommended levels in San Mateo County. Although in Santa Cruz, uh, the, that happens a little bit more often. So just, um, yeah, just a little context of how we fare. So I'm not going to talk about uh, fecal indicator bacteria. Uh, again, this is, you know, this is the big hitter. This is I'm a reason why I'm sure a lot of you are here today. Um, there's a lot of um, concern and a lot of attention for this, uh, this contaminant on the coast side. And again, for very good reason. Um, there are a number of water bodies where this is an issue. Um, but this is the contaminant um, that closes beaches. Um, and it's a public health concern. And you can see uh, from this image in the center, uh, actually a photo of one of those signs warning people that you know, recent uh, water quality testing has shown elevated levels of bacteria um, and it's not safe to swim or fish or otherwise contact with the water. And um, this image all the way to the right is actually people um, uh, going fishing for shellfish in this contaminated uh, beach. Uh, and shellfish, of course, are filter feeders. Um, so we can imagine that that contamination is going right inside the shellfish. So a uh, very dangerous thing to eat, certainly. Um, and there are uh, many action plans to deal with the contaminated water bodies that come from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, and I'm sure you all saw Heal the Bay's uh, 2020 Beach Bummer Report, which put a number of beaches in San Mateo County on their Beach Bummer list. Uh, and just for to explain the beach bummer list, what they do is they take the county's routine water quality sampling where the county collects water samples at beaches on the, uh, along the coast. Um, and they basically translate that into a letter grade. So A is good all the way down to F is a beach bummer. And so we had a few of those F grades uh, in San Mateo County um, and Fitzgerald Marine Reserve was at the very top of the list, which was a big, big surprise um, to many of us. Um, and so just going to go down and focus on a few uh, watersheds here. Um, you'll remember towards the beginning of the presentation, we said our water quality program um, basically focuses on three facets to understand, reduce, and engage. Uh, we really kind of fine-tuned this model here uh, with Pillar Point Harbor. 
Um, we've been working, trying to understand um, water quality in Pillow Point Harbor um, since the early 2000s. Um, and we've uh, mapped the stormwater system. We've collected water samples, monitoring. Um, we've scoped and dye tested to look for maybe leak leaking sewer laterals or sewer lines. Uh, and we've genetically tested bacteria. So this is a, this is a technique called microbial source tracking. It allows us to do DNA analysis of the sample and to see which animals are, are present in the sample. And then on the bottom right hand corner here, we see um, uh, a bird's eye view of the harbor with some funny green dye in it, and some pink dye. And what we did was we uh, dropped dye into the harbor and watched how long it took to move around and flush out. Um, and that allowed us to tell that the harbor actually flushes uh, water out and contaminants out every two to three days on average. Uh, we've also cleaned and repaired stormwater lines. Uh, most recently last year, we removed a big deposit of fats, oils, and grease from, uh, from a stormwater line, which I'll explain more about in a little bit. And we've engaged through our outreach uh, pet waste uh, pet waste program. So a big part of understanding sources is ruling out sources. And I'm really proud to say that we've managed to rule out some likely chronic sources um, in Pillar Point Harbor. And these are sources that uh, we have shown to be not to be chronic sources, so chronic contributors to the chronic problem at the beaches. Um, we ruled out boats in the Inner Harbor by doing water quality testing around in the Inner Harbor and found that it was not uh, tied to the beaches. Um, we found the similar result in the Outer Harbor. Uh, we did testing and ruled out dogs on the beaches as a source of the chronic bacterial pollution at the beaches. Um, we actually found that a lot of that was coming from the upland areas, so from, uh, from watersheds where upstream where it washes into creeks or stormwater systems and then discharges to the harbor. Uh, we ruled out birds as a chronic source of the pollution. And then we looked at human sources. So these are things like homeless encampments, RV dumping, or sanitary sewer overflows. And these things do happen, certainly, but they are not um, happening on a regular basis to uh, be a chronic source. Um, and then just real quickly, some of the things that we've done to address uh, likely chronic sources, uh, we've looked in, in Pillar Point Harbor, we looked at aging infrastructure. Uh, so we CCTV the stormwater system and found a couple of areas uh, where pipes need to be uh, replaced or repaired. Um, and we've, we found this large uh, deposit of fats, oils, and grease. Um, and this is a really interesting finding. Um, this is an area where uh, bacteria can uh, kind of harbor, can live outside uh, and away from the animals that are, we are, th are thought to be the main source. Um, and again, can uh, thought to be uh, not associated with pathogens. Um, for those of you that don't know, just a quick, uh, just a quick catch up on what bacteria I'm talking about. So I'm talking about bacteria that are known as fecal indicator bacteria. And these are really important because they give us an indicator of the presence of the feces of warm blooded animals, which in turn tells us about things like viruses and other pathogens that can make people sick. So these deposits of fat soils and grease, things like that, that we were kind of thinking of as secondary sources, um, those are those are high, can be high in bacteria, but are not necessarily associated with pathogens. So that's a really important distinction. Uh, we also looked at wildlife in creeks, um, very low feasibility of control. Um, you know, we're not advocating for culling of wild animals to reduce bacterial pollution. Uh, and we also looked at uh, pet waste, which I mentioned a lot of that it can come from the upland areas and wash down to the harbor. So we've installed pet waste stations and uh, we have a pet waste outreach campaign. We use social media uh, flyers and pre-COVID, we would actually go out and uh, talk to people in person. Um, and then we also looked at sediments and biofilms. Uh, and these are things like the fat soils and grease that can harbor this bacteria, but not necessarily be associated with pathogens. And as far as next steps, these are some things that we'd like to know more about to understand more fully. Um, we'd love to look at uh, more for evidence of human uh, DNA in the stormwater system, which we, um, we haven't done quite enough testing to rule it out. We found very limited evidence of it. Um, and understanding how sand as a secondary source at Capistrano Beach can impact bacteria in the water. Um, and we'd love to quantify the uh, contribution from wildlife and look for additional areas in the stormwater system that might um, have cracked pipes that let in 
groundwater or other or water from other sources and are actually cross contaminated in the pipes and then that discharges to the harbor. So I'm now going to get into San Vicente Creek. Um, this has been really, really important. A lot of a lot of interest um, for this creek, mainly because recently because it discharges to the marine, the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, uh, which got the number one um, beach bummer in 2020. Um, and we have looked at that, done that DNA testing as well as taken uh, samples to look at concentrations of bacteria. And what we found is while there are horses on the upper catchments, so that's uh, this area on the map shown in uh, purple, um, horses are by far, are certainly far from the only source of bacteria. We also see uh, deers and cow, uh, dogs, humans, and wildlife, and then those secondary sources that I mentioned. Um, so it's far from simple. Um, there are many sources um, and we are working with many partners to try to address them. Um, and I apologize uh, for this slide. I know it's very busy, um, but I wanted to include it to talk about the Beach Bummer Report um, and talk a little bit about how the creek uh, might, be, um, might be impacting uh, water quality at the beach down in the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. So this graph on the top right is the county's data from San Vicente Creek. And the graph on the bottom right is the county's data from the beach at the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. And uh, you can see orange lines are the dry season and blue lines are the wet season. And I've gone ahead and circled um, the dry season that led to the beach bummer determination. So the beach de bummer determination was from the dry season of 2019. Um, that is, was the dry season is when the most people are out there and using the beach. And you can see on the bottom right at the reserve, um, a lot of data is up above that red dashed line. So that's the upper limit of where we'd like to see bacteria. Um, and you can see up at the top right hand graph, uh, so there's some overlap. Sometimes the creek is high where the beach is high, but sometimes it's not. Uh, and just to kind of illustrate that it's a little bit more complicated, it's not a direct one-to-one -one relationship. Um, and there are many reasons why, uh, why that relationship is so muddled. And then if you look at this uh, large graph on the left, um, I went ahead and graphed data that we collected uh, from San Vicente Creek, from the upper portion east of Ethelbor Road, and the lower portion, which is the county portion, um, for four consecutive dry seasons. And this orange circle shows um, the dry period uh, during which time the beach bummer determination was made. And you can see that there's it's not a huge uh, red flag at the at the creek. You know, it doesn't really stand out. It's a little bit lower than some of the other years graphed here. Um, so just to say. Uh, there are many, there are many parts here. It's very nuanced, and it's not uh, one to one. And uh, yeah, just an interesting, uh, interesting data point that I wanted to point out. We also look at uh, bacteria on San Pedro Creek. Um, so San Pedro Creek discharges to uh, Pacific State Beach, Loma Mar, um, and uh, we look at various uh, sub watersheds of San Pedro Creek, and these are shown on this map in the various colors trying to understand where, where bacteria might be coming from and what are the, what are the variations in that. Um, and again, while there are... Um, hey Noah, there sorry, are... sorry to interrupt you, just want to do a time check that it's 6.40. Okay, thanks, Thomas. Um, we did, essentially we found uh, many different sources, um, including horses, and humans, and dogs, and wildlife and secondary sources. But again, um, there's not one single smoking gun. Uh, it's complicated and it takes many, many solutions uh, for the many, many sources of bacteria. And just to kind of summarize um, the bacteria, what we know about the bacteria issue um, on the mid coast, uh, here are two graphs uh, from the first flush program, uh, one in San Mateo County and one in Monterey County, going back to 2006, 2008. Um, and it's almost every data point on both these graphs is above those recommended ranges where we want to see uh, bacteria. But you can notice again, the top left, the numbers at the top left hand corner of each of these graphs. In San Mateo County, that number goes up to 70,000. And in Monterey, for example, it goes up to 400,000. Uh, and this is not certainly not to be dismissive, um, but just to give a, a sense of scale, essentially. And so who's, who's helping? Um, I think we've shown our current understanding of the issue, and, and, but want to get into who's helping. Um, the answer is uh, there are many of us out there helping uh, the Resource Conservation District, the county, uh, regulators, such as the Regional Water Quality Control Board, 
uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, uh, really important in partnerships with landowners and land managers, such as the Harbor District or Golden Gate National Recreation Area and the equestrian operations, uh, wastewater treatment agencies and community groups, such as the Pacifica Beach Coalition, San Pedro Creek Watership Coalition, Coastside Dog, and really importantly, all of you. Um, like I said, there are many, many sources. Uh, it's a very diffuse issue. Um, and there are certain things that you and I as individuals can do to try to help the problem as well. So on that note, uh, on what, what can you do? Um, there are kind of easier uh, behavioral changes or behavioral, uh, but we can do such as, you know, picking up after our pets or uh, cleaning up in our backyards before a rainstorm. And there are more kind of uh, operational, or sorry, uh, more things that we can implement. The top left hand photo here is a permeable paver. Um, the bottom left is a rain garden. And these are things that take advantage of natural processes to, uh, to hold water back or to filter it before it goes overland and picks up contaminants uh, and gets into our creeks and beaches. And uh, other, other examples on the top right is a stormwater catchment system and an amenity management system. Um, and thank you very much. Kelly, do you wanna take it from here? So um, I'm gonna, no, I wanna ask you a couple of questions that came in um, before in conversations that we had before. Um, first question, why aren't you talking about pesticides? What about pesticides? So pesticides are something that we're really interesting, interested in understanding. Um, essentially, uh, we're not talking about pesticides because they're uh, very difficult to test for. Pesticides are made of, uh, of a large variation of specific chemicals. Um, and it's just very difficult to uh, find one test that we can apply to many, many different um, pesticides. And where would pesticides come from? Uh, pesticides could come from agriculture, possibly, um, but we don't have evidence to suggest that currently. Um, pesticides could also come from uh, home gardens, uh, backyards, um, if they're not, you know, if people aren't applying them um, safely. All right, thanks. Um, I have heard you talking many times about uh, fecal indicator bacteria being really limited in terms of what it was, what it does or doesn't tell us about water pollution, um, and about water pollution generally, about risk to the risk to people specifically. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, I kind of hinted at a little bit in my presentation. There's a, just a ton of variation in this fecal indicator bacteria, um, and while this back, these bacteria were kind of designed to point us in the direction of pathogens and of the uh, fecal uh, of feces of warm-blooded animals. There are things like biofilms and sediments and sec those secondary sources where they can harbor that bacteria, but it can have almost nothing to do with, with pathogens. So it's, uh, it's an indirect um, and imperfect uh, model. Okay, thank you. Um, and then also the, oops, something just happened. A slide just changed. I think three is. Okay. Um, and then also, um, can you speak to Enterococcus versus E. coli? Sure. Um, so when I say fecal indicator bacteria, what I, what I mean is actually there is actually four main types of bacteria that we look for. Um, in addition to Enterococcus and E. coli, there's also total coliform and fecal coliform. And the EPA has recommended the use of E. coli for freshwater and uh, Enterococcus for a marine. Uh, for salt water. So it's essentially um, two different tools for two different environments. Um, and sort of frustratingly, they are, there's no known um, ratio between the two. So there can be, you know, three to one E. coli, two enterococcus in one sample and, and the opposite in another sample. So it doesn't allow us to make a direct comparison from creek data to beach data, even though the creek might definitely be um, impacting water quality at the beach. And, um, and you've also said that E. coli isn't the thing that gets you sick. It's just an indicator that there might be a pathogen present. But what about like when there was the E. coli outbreak from um, lettuce or that sort of thing? People got sick from that, right? Sure. Um, yeah. So the species of E. coli that we're looking at is just a different species from, um, from the one that was found on lettuce. So it's not, a, it's not a pathogenic species of E. coli. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, so um, why don't we go ahead then? We're gonna we're gonna um, ask folks, Bree, if you would be so kind to put in the chat for people the link again for anybody who came late. Um, 
and make sure that they've got the link. We're going to do a little a, a, a little quiz game show with you all, a little a, what we're calling myth or maybe. Um, we're going to ask a series of questions and have you all take a vote and um, see what you think it is. And um, then we'll ask Noah his thoughts on it. Um, so why don't we, um, I think Bree, we're going to, this is when you would be able to. Yeah, share. I'm running the screen share right now. Okay, great, thanks. So the first one. Whoop. There we go. There we go. Uh, bacteria in our creeks and beaches can make people sick. Okay. So Noah, you just answered this, but let's say it again. Um, in our area, the bacteria that we're testing for, is it the bacteria that make people sick? So the fecal indicator bacteria we are testing for are not, cannot make people sick. So this is a myth. Um, I'm suddenly realizing that the way, we, the way this was worded um, might have pushed people in the wrong direction. But um, the species of fecal indicator bacteria that we're looking at, um, they kind of point in the direction of where viruses and other pathogens um, that can make people sick might be. So they're pointing, they're pointing in the direction of where those pathogens are, but they themselves are not pathogenic. Okay. And if it's secondary sources, it means it's where these bacteria grow, but it doesn't mean that there's a high source of something that would have those pathogens necessarily. That's right. Okay, okay the next one. Bacteria um, are persisting. They're really high because no one's doing anything about it. Not seeing a lot of fluctuation on this, maybe. There we go. So Noah, is anybody doing anything about it? Is that why? Lots, there's lots of people doing uh, many things about it, um, trying to address the the sources that we know uh, and that we know how to address. There are other sources um, maybe that we haven't quite identified yet. Um, but the issue persists, I would say, mainly because there are just so many sources. Um, and there are areas like our own backyards uh, where maybe don't have a large scale management plan for. Um, and so, yeah, I have to say this is a myth. Um, lots of people are doing lots about it. There's more work to be done, um, but that's certainly not why the problem persists. I, wanna, I would remiss, be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to invite everybody on this webinar to be part of the solution. Um, so when we say somebody should do something about it, if we could start with ourselves. It was a real wake up call for me when I started doing this work years ago to, um, to recognize that um, my own dog in, in my backyard could be connected to this kind of issue. I think often, you know, it's easy to point to the receiving waters as the problem without looking at, um, you know, the sins of the watershed that drain into the harbor or the beaches or the creeks. So, okay, next one. If we made a significant enough investment, if you could wave a magic wand, have limitless resources, um, then we could find and remediate the source and the solution to pollution. What do you think, Noah? Seems about three to one here, maybe to myth. Um, what do you think? Um, I'd, I'd say this is more of a myth than a maybe, but uh, perhaps somewhere in between. Um, there is certainly additional investment needed. Um, but I think the real, the myth here is the source and the solution. Um, you know, we do have, like I said, many times uh, today, there are many, many sources and uh, what you were just getting at Calix is it really requires many, many solutions, many, many of us working together to try to uh, fix the issue. Um, <clears throat> but I would, I would like to say that, um, you know, even if there was a significant investment um, to say, fix all the infrastructure problems that might contribute to uh, bacteria today, that doesn't rule out that uh, it wouldn't require an additional investment in the future. So I think just stewardship requires ongoing input, ongoing buying, ongoing investment. So we should prepare for ongoing investments um, that the conditions might change and that there's always work to be done, basically. Yeah, and I don't, I don't mean purely um, financial investments. Right. Got it. Got it. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, I think that is the last one of the, oh, that's, oh, nope, what, nope, that was right. There was another one. Oh, dogs. Dogs are the primary source of bacteria in our area. We hear that sometimes. No, are dogs the primary source of, of bacteria in our area? Oh, it's a strong, strong myth, Kellex. Dogs are a source, but they're certainly not the primary source. Um, again, um, when we do that microbial source tracking, so that DNA analysis of, of water samples, um, we often find um, several, several sources in those samples. Dogs can be one of them, but not always. Um, they're a source, but not the primary source. I think a key thing about dogs is that they're a really controllable source of bacteria, right? So why not clean up after your pet? Clean up in your backyard before a wet weather event or in regularly, clean up after your dog when you're walking them, um, et cetera. Um, but, it, but even if we were, I mean, it's, it's, control, it's a pretty controllable source, so it's something that we can do, um, but it's not going to get rid of all the bacterial problems that we have, yeah. right? Definitely. And I, and I look at our uh, pet waste outreach program where we try to educate people about the importance of cleaning up after their pets as kind of um, preventative medicine, trying to stop bacteria before it gets into the into the creek. So although it might it might be the thing that people see the most, um, it doesn't it's not indicative of it of it being the primary source, but rather it's it's kind of it's it's a source that you can target with outreach and education and it doesn't require, you know, like a new a new pipe for um, a new uh, stormwater management pro uh, project. Okay, and the next one. Oh, horses. Horses are the source of bacteria in San Vicente Creek and Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. There's a lot of horses up there, those two equestrian operations. What do you think, Noah? Uh, myth, uh, again, horses are a source of bacteria, but they are not the source of bacteria in San Vicente Creek um, and at the reserve. Uh, and, you know, for example, um, there's not really a clear mechanism for um, horse manure getting into the creek during, during the dry season, um, right, where we don't have storms washing, maybe washing uh, things like that into the creek, but we do still see high bacteria. Uh, we also see uh, wildlife or you know secondary sources like those biofilms and sediments I mentioned, um, and um, and, he, and of course uh, human DNA as well. So it is not the source, but one of the sources. In fact, there have been times when we did monitoring where there were not spikes of bacteria on San Vicente Creek until we got west of Highway One. Um, but again, manure, horse manure, is something that's controllable, and so I'll. I'll all best management practices should be implemented to control that source, right? Okay, um, Bree, next, uh, next slide. Pollution in my backyard away from a creek doesn't matter as much as pollution at the beach. What do folks think? Huh, there must be something with this link because it's not, it's not we're not seeing a response. No. Um, says the screen's unchanged since last open it. You know, that's okay, we can, we can skip to, we can skip to ahead. Um, and we're gonna go to some questions from folks anyway, because we've only got a few minutes left. Before we do, I wanna say, take a screenshot of this or take a photo with your phone. Um, if you wanna sign up for our newsletter, go to our webpage to get updates about water quality and other work. Also, we post alerts and sometimes information on Facebook or Instagram. We will be posting this webinar and there's other webinars on YouTube. Noah's email address is there. We will be, um, any question that we don't get to that uh, that's in the, in the chat today, We the ones that we do get to and the ones that we don't get to, both of them, we're going to write up answers and send them out to everybody who is registered for this webinar. So if you didn't get an answer to your question during this time together, it's okay, we're still going to answer it if we can, to the best of, we, of our knowledge. And, and if we can't, there are so many experts with whom we partner, we'll ask them to help as well. So um, that said, why don't I take uh, a moment to get to some of these questions. Um, who posts the polluted beach signs? Maybe they should be multilingual. 
Um, so the, the county posts those, the county does the routine water quality sampling and they uh, post those signs when water quality is, uh, is essentially above those thresholds. Um, and I completely agree, those, that would be great if they were bilingual. Um, I'm gonna send out an email about that, see what we can do about that. Thank you. And I know that one is bilingual, the one that's at uh, by Barbara's Fish Trap is bilingual. Um, what are the upland areas where pet waste feeds into Pillar Point Harbor is that where your campaigns were focused on? Uh, yeah, great question. So the upland areas that, so if you look at a map of Pillar Point Harbor, and I'm sorry, I don't have one uh, to share with you right now. There are uh, several creeks that discharge the Pillar Point Harbor. Um, what is there? Deer Creek. Kelly, can you help me remember some of these creeks? Oh, I'm blanking on them right now. I was, I was looking at the next question. And and I anyway, it is, but there are, there are several, it's a pretty large watershed with multiple creeks that discharge to Pillar Point Harbor. Um, and we do target our um, efforts um, to those to those watersheds, um, and we hope to actually ramp up our um, pet waste outreach uh, programs to um, to do a little bit more targeted outreach and education to those watersheds in the future. Can you speak to outdoor cats? Are they part of the dog situation too? I'm, I'm sorry, Bonnie Bonnie DeBerry. Thank you, Deniston, St. Augustine, Deer Creek, and Campus Run and Drainage. Thank Thanks, you. Bonnie. Um, can you speak to outdoor cats? Are they part of the uh, the problem as well? Um, <clears throat> I really don't know much about cats, but um, it makes sense that cat cat waste would also be a contributor. Um, and maybe if you if you see pet waste in your backyard uh, and you have time to clean it up before a storm, um, you should maybe pick that up as well as your dog waste as well. Um, and, uh, oh, I was just going to say, Bonnie, if you wanted to post, um, Bonnie DeBerry, who's a, an expert who's in this, um, says we do not have a genetic test for felines yet. So um, we don't have a way of doing that uh, microbial source tracking for cats yet. Not yet. Um, uh, next question. If a yard is flat, is there any potential for pet waste to get into the ocean? Somebody has a goat, but the yard is totally flat. Uh, yes. Um, I, I'm sure even if it's totally flat, it's not going to be able to, not all the rainwater that falls in there is not going to be able to go into the groundwater, sorry, into the soil, into the groundwater table. Some of that, some of that water is going to be uh, flowing somewhere else and washing uh, down, downhill, downstream. Yeah. So. And, and to that person who asked that question, invite us out and we can come take a look with you and help you figure out if, um, how, if, if it's a problem. Um, do you, um, Let's see, does the RCD have storm drain maps of the coast? Um, no, not of the entire coast. We've done some CCTVing. So when we send a, a camera down into some sections of the stormwater lines around Pillow Point Harbor, but we do not have um, much beyond that. Uh, two more questions in the time that we have before we do one final activity with folks, um, which is, one is, uh, and there are so many questions that have come in, so we're gonna have to give people written responses. Are there any indications that the measures taken to address chronic bacteria sources have been effective? Can you repeat that? Sorry, one more time. Are there, oh, um, oh sorry, I just got another message that confused me. Are there any, um, any, oh, hold on, let me read it again. Are there any indications that the measures taken to address chronic bacteria sources have been effective? Um, there, there certainly are. Um, for example, we removed um, a large deposit of fat soils and grease um, from a stormwater line at Pillar Point Harbor. Um, and what we found is that um, one of our metrics uh, did um, decrease significantly um, but it wasn't clearly shown over time. The, the kind of long answer is that we don't design our monitoring programs to, to test a really clear before and after for a lot of our watersheds. Um, so it can be really difficult to show if one, um, if one project had a, a large effect. Um, I guess I'd have to say that there are um, just, again, so many sources um, that it's hard to, hard to know what's gonna move the dial. And Dave Olson has offered that County Public Works in response to a previous question, has stormwater pipe and inlet maps for the unincorporated coast. Half Moon Bay has them within their boundaries and the County DPW maps are online, but hard to find. So maybe what we can do is we can send out a link to that with um, the information we send out to people who've registered. And we also, as part of the work um, to understand the sources of fecal contamination in the Pillar Point Harbor, we integrated a lot of those uh, maps and um, develop some of our own maps for that 
for that area draining into the harbor. So there are many other questions here um, and, and, and I thank people for their interest. I want to go to one more slide. Brie, can you do that, that next one? Just wanna ask folks before we leave today, one word that describes something that you're taking away from our time together. I know we packed a lot into one hour. I honestly didn't think that, um, I, wouldn't, I didn't know if people would be that interested in a full hour. Now I really wish that we'd scheduled two hours or at least an hour and a half. It's complicated. There's uncertainty. Oh, somebody's feeling gratitude. I feel gratitude also. Tricky, hopeful. Inf information, interesting information. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad to see hopeful on there. I'm hopeful, hopeful and motivated. A few, a few hopeful. That's good. I'm glad. I feel hopeful too. Actually, people are focused on solutions. Um, somebody said they felt uh, motivated. Um, seems like there's interest in accountability, multivariable. Um, bacteria was a big takeaway for somebody. Bacteria is certainly one of the major pollutants that we're tracking. M major uh, impairments. Um, somebody found this to be informative. I assume it was a reference to this uh, workshop. So that's great. Well, we are um, a couple minutes over. I want to thank everyone who, who showed up today and um, has an interest in this topic. And I want to thank you for being watershed stewards. I want to thank Noah um, for his hard work in this. I want to thank our partners, all those people who are doing this work, Surfrider, the county, the regional board, um, the beach coalitions, the watershed coalitions, um, et cetera. Even further south, the San Gregorio Environmental Resource Center has volunteers that do water quality monitoring work. The, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary partners, just, um, just many thanks to all of them. Um, if you're interested in doing another webinar with a deeper dive on, on one of these topics, we're, we're happy to, to do that as well and bring the information that we have. So thank you so much. And um, and um, we'll be in touch. Bye.